My name is Hardeep Dinza, which I'm probably the only Hardeep Dinza ever born in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, <laughs> but that's where I was born. And uh, just to let you guys know, I'm an ophthalmologist who specialized in retina disease. I trained at Baylor, and uh, then I went overseas for 10 years, and so um, got a, a ton of experience. If we combine everybody's ages in here, I'm probably older than everybody combined in retina dog years after working for 10 years overseas. Um, how many people here either have or know someone who has macular degeneration? All right, so pretty much almost everybody here. So, you know, it is um, the most common cause of visual impairment uh, in people over 55 in the developed world. Now, most people in the world never get macular degeneration, you know, in places where I've worked because people just don't live long enough. It's a, the full name is age-related macular degeneration. But um, we have some, you know, we have, I'll talk about 30 or 45 minutes about macular degeneration. Happy to answer any questions, and you know, you can interrupt me, keep it kind of casual here. And um, so we'll talk about that. Kind of we'll start out with the basics and kind of go on. Uh, from there. So, you know, right now um, we've got about um, uh, about 4 million people, you know, uh, in America with macular degeneration. 2 million, well, we have 2 million. It's projected to go to about 4 million or double it, by 2050. And um, we have a lot of people who are at risk for macular degeneration. About 7 million now is projected to go to 14 million by 2050. And that's, you know, because we have a population that's continuing to age. And thanks to modern medicine, we can all live longer and enjoy our lives. And, you know, my job is to help everybody keep seeing during these longer years. And uh, so I got that slide off of um, an industry, you know, uh, a website. So there's tons of, um, uh, of of uh, pharmaceutical companies who are invested in trying to create new treatments um, because the market is large. So this is this was a marketing slide. They showed you know we've got a big market here if we can um, create new treatments. So there's a large incentive, in other words, for drug companies to continue to develop new treatments for macular degeneration. Did you say this was U.S.? Yeah, yeah. So. So, as I mentioned, it's a leading cause of visual impairment in people over 55. Diabetes is the leading cause of visual impairment in people under 55. And we have a lot of patients now who have diabetes and macular degeneration, and we got to treat both. Um, the full name is age-related macular degeneration, and it is part of the body's natural aging process. So, just, uh, you know, I, I'm a retina guy, I'm a macular guy, but, I, I, you know, the, for me, the whole purpose of the eye is to focus light on the macula. So when light comes into your eye, like that's illustrated by that beam right there, it comes through the, and I'll show you a little bit more uh, diagrams, comes through the cornea and then through the pupil, then the lens focuses it, and it all comes right down there. That entire orange structure is the retina. The center of the retina is the macula, and all the light is focusing, coning down into the macula. So that's where your sharpest vision, your color vision is. And uh, so this is just, you know, some basic eye anatomy just to orient us. So, you know, when light comes into our eye, it, it gets focused, it initially hits the cornea right here. When people have LASIK, the cornea is reshaped. So the cornea starts to converge those light rays. It comes through the pupil. And then the lens here, um, the lens further focuses the light right, to, right into here, into the center of the macula. And it's also illustrated right here. Just, this isn't really macular degeneration, but you see how that lens has a certain amount of thickness? Well, when, you're, when, when we're young, all of us are younger, that lens can flex back and forth, back and forth. So when you are reading something up close, the lens gets thicker, increases its focusing power, and we see well. But then, as we get older, that lens becomes stiffer. So we have a harder time, you know, seeing things up close, because the lens can't thicken. You know, and our arms only get so long, and then we got to get reading glasses, you know. 
So, uh, that, and then when it gets opaque, you know, uh, then that's a cataract, and you have cataract surgery, and, you know, there are various options uh, for the lens implants. The lens implant that's placed is about one-tenth the thickness of that. So it's not as thick as your natural lens. But we're not talking about cataracts, but just to give you a little basic eye anatomy, also, you can see here, the eye is surrounded by all these bones, you know, and there's a lot of times when we're on trauma call and a patient has a car accident <coughs> and uh, those bones do a really good job of protecting the eye in, in many, many patients. And uh, so God designed that really well. Okay, so now if we were to, now we're going to look at the center of the retina, the macula, and um, what we can see is that Within the retina, there are these blood vessels right in here. In the very center of the retina, there are no blood vessels because we don't want, we want that to be just pure rods and cones so that none of the light's being um, diffracted or reflected. And so I'll show you in another photo what that looks like from a side view. But, but that little area, and this is about 350 microns, right? Much, much smaller than the tip of a pencil, is where your 2020 vision is, your color vision is. And that, this entire area is a macula, but this center of that macula is what gets affected with macular degeneration. It would be great if all those changes we saw didn't happen in the 350 microns, but that's where it is. And when, when light, you know, I could do a whole other talk because it's unbelievable. I mean, it is crazy that these photons of light come into our eye and our eye then <laughs> takes those photons of light and a chemical reaction occurs in rods and cones An electrical current is generated. That electrical current goes here to the optic nerve. That's the end of a cable. that goes to the back of your brain and we see, I mean, the miracle of seeing, it's, it, that's worthy of, you know, a lecture, I mean, but we're talking about macro generation here, so. All right, so, okay, so this is a side view, and so this is your retina right here. It's about 250 microns on a side view, <coughs> and what I wanted to really show you here is that underneath the retina, you see all this red here, the red blood vessels? That layer is called a choroid. That is the most vascular layer in the entire body. So why do we need so much um, blood flow? Because the retina is so metabolically active. And so what happens in wet macular degeneration, oh, and these are rods and cones. So all of these are the, um, the cells that convert light energy to electrical, well, th through a chemical reaction to electrical energy. But this, this little layer right here, this is the bottom layer of the retina, it's called the RP layer, is the most important layer. That layer is like a, um, what are those things called? Uh, uh, those walls, you know, they don't let water in. Uh, it's like 20 questions. What? Dam? Yeah, like a dam, I guess you could say that, because this is kind of swampy. <coughs> but if you get a defect in that layer, then you, the retina starts getting wet and it gets blood vessels growing through there. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And this just shows that at a cellular level from the choroid, a little blood vessel popping the retaining wall, through the retaining wall and um, going in the retina. Okay, so this is a cross section of the retina. Remember how I was saying that um, in the very center of the macula, there's no blood vessels, but there's also less cells. These are just basically rods and cones right here where all the light is focusing. There are multiple layers uh, in the retina, which we'll, we'll, you know, have a pop quiz afterwards. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Okay, um, but the rods and cones are the most important layer. And that retaining wall layer that we just talked about, the RPE is right here. And that is the most important layer in the retina to prevent these blood vessels from popping up and causing problems. This is called an optical coherence uh, a tomogram. And um, if you go to a retina doctor's office, um, they're gonna take a picture, we will take a picture of your eye with this. This is an incredible resolution. This is 250 microns. We can resolve it down to the one micron level. The camera costs $120,000, but it gives us a lot of information about your retina. The other thing that you, if you go to a retina doctor's office is we also want to get a face on view of the retina. So we do a test called fluorescein angiography where we inject some dye in your arms. And then as the dye circulates from your arm, up to your heart and up into your eye, we take a series of photos that gives us a face on view. This is uh, a normal retina and this shows very clearly there are no blood vessels in the center of the uh, retina. You can see the blood vessels here. 
And, and it, whereas this patient has wet macular degeneration and there's some leakage of new blood vessels there. So you can see the information that an angiogram provides. So if you have this diagnosis, we're going to uh, of macular, or something we're trying to figure it out, we're probably going to do both of those tests. And then we also use those tests to follow the effectiveness of the treatment. Now, am I giving you guys too much information, speaking too fast? Is it clear? Okay, Just, yeah, I'm happy because, you know, anyway. All right, so what are the symptoms? So re remember, it damages the center of the retina. If you have blurry vision, distorted vision, where straight lines look crooked, or if you have a dark spot in your vision that's either right in the center or right off center, those can all be signs of macular degeneration. Now, one of the things is that many of us, we, um, including myself, we all like to doctor ourselves and we'll go, you know, look up on the internet, my vision's blurry and you'll see cataracts. So many patients think that their vision loss is due to cataracts and uh, it's really not that, um, not always the case and then people will come to us late so if you have vision problems you know you need to see an eye doctor um and also i don't know does any does everyone know the difference between optometry and ophthalmology that's kind of an important thing so an ophthalmologist is someone who's gone to medical school uh, and an, an optometrist who's spent four years uh, during their college year specializing in eyes we work together um but uh, generally for surgery, laser, that kind of thing, you, you know, you, you go to an ophthalmologist. Um, there are, but we do work as a team together and um, we have a good relationship with both the general ophthalmologist and the optometrist. Um, I guess just to let you know, so, you know, to be an ophthalmologist, you do four years of medical, well, four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, a year of internship, three years of residency. And then in my case, I did two years of retina research and a year of a retina fellowship. So it takes a while to get to that level. I mean, you're looking at specializing, you know, 350 microns of tissue. So it takes, you know, like 11 years. But, uh, <laughs> so, all right. So the activities that can be affected. So if like, what, if your loved one says, you know, they're having a hard time reading or doing close work like knitting. Um, and then especially if they complain about driving, you know, you need them to see an eye uh, person, uh, you know, sooner than later. But blurry vision, distorted vision, and a dark spot, those are the key symptoms of this condition. You never go blind, right? You never go blind from macular degeneration. That's like a really important thing to realize. But y you do get this loss of central vision. So, you know, this you know, poor lady can't see her, her, her son playing soccer, can't see his face. So, I mean, it has a huge visual impact on people. And, you know, what I find is that it's incredible in America, right, where all of us uh, are, remain independent for so many years of our life. Uh, we don't have the extended families that we have in other cultures. So a lot of us, you know, we just go on. And um, when a patient gets diagnosed with this, it can be devastating if they, uh, you know, can't uh, drive and they lose their independence. So it's so um, important for us um, as our team to try to help people retain their vision. One of the ways we ask people to monitor their vision is just with a piece of paper that has some lines on it, a grid, we call it an Amsler grid. I, I don't know, Amsler was probably the guy who came up with the idea. But um, if you look at this piece of paper at the central dot, one eye at a time, and you notice distortion like that, that means you probably have macular degeneration. And we ask all our patients to monitor their vision with that grid, and if they notice a change, to let us know. Okay, so now before I kind of get into the anatomy, are there any questions on what else? Yes, sir. So when this uh, grid that you showed that the, the, the lines are crooked, if it's too far, then it can't be... Not necessarily. Not ne that it, so if the lines get crooked, it doesn't indicate whether it's early or late in the disease. But if you, as soon as you see the lines get crooked, you know, you want to get evaluated. Definitely, like any other condition, the sooner you get it to treat it, the better, sir. Wait, excuse me. Macular than they are for uh, are the are the symptoms any different for macular than they are for cataracts? Yes, sir. So generally, uh, there are different kinds of cataracts, but generally with cataracts, things will look blurrier. Um, you will have dimness, and you will have glare, or one of those three symptoms. But you won't have distortion. See, distortion is a really important point. And you won't have a blind spot either in, in the center or right next to the center. That's more related to macular degeneration. 
But, uh, you know, once you get past 50, it's definitely worthwhile to have regular eye exams because the other thing to remember is that whether you have cataracts or retina problems, you don't have any pain with it. And the other thing to remember is you got two eyes. So a lot of times people come in late because the other eye compensated. And then you look at, and oh, that eye went bad, you know, five years ago probably. And now, the, you know, so it's good to get an eye exam. There's no pain. And one eye will compensate for the other, and you won't know. That's a big problem. Any other questions right now? Yes, ma'am. Um, that was half the answer to my question. Is it typical that you would get macular degeneration in both eyes? Yeah, you, you can. It's typical. In fact, it would be atypical to have it only in one eye. Then we, wouldn't be, we would be thinking there's something else going on. But you can have different stages in each of the two eyes. Yeah. Is there a cure for macular degeneration? Great question. Well, there's not a cure, but we can keep it under control. And, we'll, and that actually seg segues into the next part of the presentation. So that was perfect. Okay. So, you know, um, when we get older, we get these aging spots under our skin, these little brown spots. Most of us have them, you know. Um, and, and that is the buildup of some metabolic waste at a cellular level. Those brown spots um, in the retina can occur, like these, but they're yellow, and we call them drusen. Drusen means little pebble in German. So it was a German guy who first discovered these in the early 1900s. And um, these drusen in themselves um, are a sign of early macular degeneration, the dry form. We'll talk about dry versus wet. Drusen generally, not a, in a general, don't cause uh, visual disturbance. But remember these drusen, um, they occur in that retaining wall and they make one at risk for new blood vessels popping up through the underlying layer, the choroid. I showed you that picture before. And um, so they, they, they weaken the retaining wall and can make one have a, 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 an increased risk for wet macular degeneration. So when you come into my office, I'm looking at the number and the size of drusen because I, cate I will categorize you in five different levels of this early dry macular degeneration and let you know if vitamins will help. Vitamins are not necessary for everybody with drusen and um, we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But that's the early stage of dry macular degeneration, usually not, not visually significant. This person is lucky because they don't really have any, maybe that one, drusen in the very center because that's really what counts, that very center. The center of the macula is called a fovea, uh, just, uh, um, I don't know, for interest. Um, now, when people talk about dry macular degeneration, a lot of folks correctly have the understanding that dry macular degeneration generally doesn't cause vision loss, but there is an advanced form of dry macular degeneration that can cause vision loss. This is pretty rare, but what happens is all those drusen, you know, those little deposits, they take a toll on the cells, and the cells get knocked off, that RPE layer that I showed you earlier. And if those cells get knocked off, they should probably use a you know, more politically correct word, atrophy, I don't know, then you can have visual loss. This patient um, has advanced dry macular degeneration with cell loss. And you can see the scalloped edge right here. The bottom layer of the retina, that RPE layer, that's the, the barrier layer, is gone. And you can see these larger uh, orangish blood vessels. Those are the layers of that underlying um, layer underneath the retina called the choroid. You normally don't see those. Like over here, you don't see the choroidal vessels. Here you can see them because th this entire area of cells has been wiped out. And this is the center of the macula. So if those cells are wiped out, that can affect vision. So the underlying point is, even with dry macular degeneration, there are a very small percentage of patients who can have vision loss. But 99% of people with dry macular degeneration don't have cell loss and don't have vision loss. Just to be clear about that. Then the, the, the thing that we're gonna talk about next now is wet macular degeneration. So in wet macular degeneration, as I showed in that earlier slide, that barrier gets disrupted, new blood vessels pop up from the choroid. These new blood vessels can leak fluid, which they generally leak fluid. They can bleed. This patient has some bleeding. Um, and these blood vessels, think of them like um, the roots of a tree. When they grow, 
uh, they, they are thick and they scar. And that scarring is what leads to permanent visual loss. So we want to get, you know, in, in response to your question, sir, we want to get to those blood vessels when they're just little baby dandelions and knock them out before they become this huge scar. Okay. And, um, and so this is a patient with a color photo which shows the blood around the macula. On the angiogram here, the blood is blocking some of the uh, fluorescence. But then in the late frames, you can see where there's this abnormal leakage where it's really white there. So that angiogram helps us along with the OCT in helping to figure out uh, what the uh, cause of the uh, abnormalities are. You can have both. So this patient, this has a scalloped edge here of dry macular degeneration. Uh, you can see the underlying choroidal vessels, but they also have blood in the middle. So they have advanced dry and wet. So you can have both kinds of macular degeneration in one eye. What are the risk factors? Well, age, right, is the biggest risk factor. It's very rare for anyone under 50, 55 to get uh, age-related macular degeneration. You can have other macular conditions, but not age-related macular degeneration. Northern European descent, being a female, positive family history, smoking, um, high blood pressure. I have smoking twice. Just to emphasize, you don't want to <laughs> smoke. <laughs> you don't want to smoke. That is the biggest risk factor of all. Um, now, there have been a lot of uh, interesting genetic studies that have showed that genes that are involved in the complement pathway, which is a pathway that's involved in inflammation, um, is highly prevalent uh, in people with macular degeneration. So a lot of the newer therapies are looking at um, anti-inflammatory medications, um, and that's also potentially uh, why antioxidant vitamins work, and we'll talk about that um, in a minute. And then, um, you know, as I mentioned before, the size and number of drusen are a big risk factor for wet macular degeneration. And that's something that we categorize as retina specialists. If you go to an optometrist or even a general ophthalmologist, they're not going to categorize the, the, uh, the level of drusen in your eye. They're not going to stage it from a level of zero to five, which you do want. Um, and there's four retina people in this town, so you have a lot of choices. But the bottom line is that you want that staging to know what your risk factor is and whether or not you need to be on vitamins. And you don't want to be on vitamins unless you have to because you know all of these studies show that when you get on high dose vitamins, like, like for example, in the uh, vitamins that are recommended, there's 400 um, uh, units of vitamin E. Well, you know, two years ago we found out 500 units increases your risk for heart attack and stroke. So these high dose vitamins can have negative effects. You don't want to be on them unless you have to. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there. So, you know, basically this is just, this was a graph from the, there's only been one very well stu done study which showed <laughs> which vitamins are beneficial. And that was called the age-related eye disease study. And and as part of that, just to give you an this is a graph from that study. If you have small drusen, in within 10 years, your risk of getting wet macular degeneration, you know, is about 1%. However, if you have medium size, so I'm categorizing them in, at a micron level when I'm looking at you. If you categorize it as a medium drusen and you have it in both eyes, then over 10 years, your risk of getting wet macular degeneration is 15%. So that's you know, part of the stratification and part of the um, uh, information that you'll get when you have a, a retinal exam. So what's the treatment? So you know, when I was overseas you know, taking care of babies with tumors and you know, most of my patients had one eye and they were young and, and I was so grateful along with all my other retina friends that we were not in America at that time. This was about uh, 15, 20 years ago. Because at that time the only treatment for wet macular degeneration involved lasering the center of your retina with a hot laser and burning it. And then you would, they would, there was a study, it was a good study, but it showed that uh, in a two years from the time you got the laser, you'd be better off than if you didn't get the laser. But when you got the laser, you dropped six lines of vision. Thank God I never had to do that. I would be like, <laughs> you know. So we got better treatments now. And we have these miracle drugs. Um, these drugs are all called anti-vascular endothelial growth factor drugs. Now I'm going to be, you know, I'm a, it's a layman's talk, so 
I'm basically your eye gardener. If you think of these blood vessels like weeds in your eye, the, all of these drugs, they are um, weed killers. I mean, they're not as toxic as Roundup, you know. But, but basically, that's what we do. And uh, these blood vessels, to grow, they need growth factors. The medication that we inject in your eye takes away those, sops up those growth factors, take them away, and then the blood vessels shrink down. And they stop leaking and they stop bleeding and we limit the size of the scar. Um, sometimes we do use the laser in, in conjunction with this, but this is your primary uh, line of treatment now. And there's three different ones. And I'll, it's an, this is actually an interesting story. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, we're at about 27 minutes. Let me see, let's, what's the next slide here? This, okay, so where do we inject the medication? We inject it, we've only got about a one millimeter space where we can inject. So we measure when we do the injection, or actually I don't always measure now because I just know it, I've done millions of these. But if you inject it right here, you're gonna hit the retina, cause a retinal detachment. If you inject it over here, you're gonna hit the lens and get a cataract, or if you had a, a lens implant, you can dislocate the lens implant. So we've got about a one millimeter space. We inject the medicine into the eye, and, and um, it gets into and through the retina. It gets so it absorbs through that retina. The retina is like wallpaper in the back of the eye. But it gets through the wallpaper, gets to the bottom where the blood vessels are growing, and knocks them out. And um, these shots are usually required every four to six weeks in the beginning. Um, some people, you know, if they're lucky, they only need one shot and they're done. That's pretty rare. Most people need seven or eight shots over the course of a year. And then in the second year, hopefully, you can you know, go down to three or four, and by the third year, hopefully, you know, you don't need any. But it's variable, and you can't predict who's going to need how many shots and how they're going to respond. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of an interesting story. So how did we, how did these drugs, um, how were they um, initially found out to be of help? Well, there was a really smart guy in uh, Miami named Phil Rosenfeld, who was one of these, I was in, you know, I was in the third world and he was a depressed guy working here, lasering people's maculas. And he said, there's gotta be a better treatment. Um, we know the problem is new blood vessel growth. There's a new agent out on the market called Avastin. Avastin is an agent that shrinks blood supplies to tumors. Hey, let's give it to some people of wet macular degeneration and see what happens. So he gave it through the IV and like 30 patients, got good results and said, well, you know, giving this high dose of Avastin through your IV just to you know, treat this little 350 micron area in the eye doesn't make sense. Let's just start sticking in people's eyes. Not quite that cavalier, but you know, <laughs> but he was excited. And uh, you know, I still remember when we first started doing this, you know, we hardly ever would, would inject people's, uh, you know, with drugs in their eyes. And we were all like, wow, we're really gonna be doing this? Um, and now, you know, we can do 15 to 20 of these a day, you know? So we do it all the time. We're like human syringes. Um, <laughs> So, so th this drug we injected in your eye and it shrinks up the blood vessels. Um, now, Avastin is made by a company named Genentech. Now, Genentech, meanwhile, you know, this, so that's an off-label use. 70% of all drugs that are used in America are used off-label because drug companies can go through the FDA and get approval for every indication because it costs about a billion dollars in America, that's why a lot of trials go overseas now, to get approval for one indication for one drug. So um, if you get an infection in your eye, we will give you antibiotics in your eye. We've been doing that for 50 years. That's not FDA approved. So I if we didn't do that though, you would, you know, you'd have an eye full of pus and be taken out of your head, right? So, so that, that's if it was an off-label use. Well now, meanwhile, Genentech was uh, going through the FDA trials to get Lucentis approved. Um, and it's a cousin drug to Avastin. Avastin may be more efficacious, although there was a recent NIH trial that showed they're probably equivalent. And so Avastin is made by um, compounding pharmacies. Uh, actually, in the third world, what happens is that you get all your patients in your macular degeneration. The doctor draws up each individual dose from uh, uh, the uh, vial and injects everybody at that day. But in America, we do it in compounding pharmacies. So the cost of Avastin is anywhere from $50 to $100 every four to six weeks. The cost of Lucentis is $2,000 every four to six weeks. Wow. So these drug companies, it's also really interesting. They act, there's actually another market. There's a huge industry of consultants who let the drug company know how much Medicare is going to pay them. 
So they, they consult with Medicare and say, okay, we think you can get 2,000. Or there's another drug just approved called Jatria, $3,900. So, so, you know, so that's 2,000. That's Avastin. When, when I was with my old group, Nevada Retina, we calculated over five years. We saved the government $12 million by using Avastin. Ma'am? Isn't Avastin, though, um, a cancer agent? Yeah, it's an anti-cancer drug. Right. right. And isn't Alia um, not an anti-cancer? Sorry. That's fine. So, so the, the, the latest drug that came out on the market is ILEA. They price themselves $200 less than Lucentis. But what's cool about ILEA is that it has the same um, mechanism of action as a vast and Lucentis plus one more. So remember I said these are all anti-vascular endothelial growth factor agents. This also has something called antiplatelet derived growth factor. So it knocks out another growth factor that's responsible for blood vessel growth. So we, um, if a patient doesn't respond to Avastin, we'll usually go to ILEA. You don't or you do? We do. We do. I usually skip Lucentis and go to ILEA if, if a patient's not responding to Avastin. Most patients, 95% of patients respond to Avastin. And um, it just, so that's what we use mostly. But if we're going to go to another agent, we'll go to ILEA, uh, at least in my practice. Now, just to let you know, there are, like in the Midwest, there are insurance companies that are requiring everybody get started with Avastin. And only after a couple of tries with Avastin will the insurance company pay for ILEA to be used. So this is another huge issue for um, patients and for doctors. So if, we, if I inject a $2,000 drug in your eye and the insurance company doesn't pay, you know, you have to pay or I have to pay. And I don't want any of us to have to pay. But these drugs are really, really expensive. So, okay, uh, now let's just go on to the next thing. Um, now, I don't, a lot of times videos don't work in these kind of presentations. Let's just see if it does work. It kind of depends on the resolution of the, uh, yeah. So I'm going to show you another thing you can do for macular degeneration. And this, I wanted to show you, well, I want to turn the lights out. You want to turn the lights out? Can we keep them on? Yeah, sure. I don't know. Okay. So this is, this is I want to show you this video. So just so you get to see the retina, you know, kind of like in real life. So this is a patient who is having a vitrectomy. There's a gel that fills the back of the eye. And the surgery they're going to have is to move the macula to a new location. So we remove the jelly from the eye so we can access the retina. And then we inject fluid underneath the retina to actually detach the retina. And you can see these little um, kind of bubbles of fluid. So we're going to detach the retina. And then the next step is we're going to have all these bubbles of fluid coalesce. Okay, so this is an eight-minute video, so we're just going to skip along a bit. Okay, now the retina's been cut 360, and now we're pulling it off the eye wall. Now you can see that's the retina. The retina has a consistency of wet tissue paper. It's very easy to tear. That's the patient who's had previous laser right there. So we very gently peel it off of the eye wall. Okay, all the way to the optic nerve. That optic nerve acts like the spoke in a wheel. Okay, now this is a patient right there who has this choroidal neovascular membrane coming off of the choroid. It has wet macular degeneration. It's kind of thick, it's scarred, there's blood vessels there. And we're, what we're doing is we're releasing the retina from that scarred area. Okay. Will that tissue go back? No, but we don't care because we're going to move the macula to a new location. So now, now we inject this heavy liquid in the eye. This is called perfluorooctane. You can see it kind of opening up the flower of the detached retina there. And then, now with that, I don't know if you saw that, where the macula is being rotated. See how the blood vessels are moving? That was the old macula, where it's yellow is the new macula. So we can rotate the retina away from the damaged area, like that. And, but this is a good video just so you can see what the retina is really like, you know what I mean? Okay, and then at the end of it, we take that heavy liquid out, we put oil in, and we laser the retina 360 degrees on the sides where we did the cutting. 
Now, this uh, surgery uh, is very rarely required. Most people don't need it. And it's usually you only reserve it for the second eye because it's so complicated. And in fact, right now, there's only two of us in America who do this. Um, and the only reason I do it is because I'm, you know, 2,000 years old in retina dog years. Spent all those years in the third world. Yes, sir? Yeah, you saw, yeah, that was a laser, yeah. So, uh, so, so we only use, so that's another <coughs> form of treatment where if you have your second eye and now, you know, um, it's gone to legally blind, which is 2200, which again is not total blindness, we can try to remove your retina to a new location. This can be used for advanced dry macular degeneration and for wet macular degeneration. Now, if it works, which is about 40% of the time, unfortunately, only, and there's a reason for that, but if it works, then I rotate your retina 45 degrees, like you're really happy, except your neck is hurting because you've got to rotate your neck 45 degrees because everything looks crooked. So what you do is two months later, you take the muscles of the eye and you, and you, and you rotate them 45 degrees and reattach them to the eye so the eye gets straight again and then everything looks straight. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, so now let's just talk about what we can do to try to prevent things from getting worse. Number one is if you smoke, you got to stop um, keeping your blood pressure under good control. You know, we're not going to stop aging or, or our gender, you know, or uh, we're not going to have any like transgendered like surgery for this, you know. Um, and, um, you know, we, we were born from whatever genes we have, and, and that's that. But, but so this big study of about 4,000 patients, it was called Age-Related Eye Disease Study, funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and it was done about 15 years ago. It showed that you could decrease the risk of wet macular degeneration by taking this combination of vitamins, vitamin C, E, beta carotene, zinc, and copper. There's been a couple smaller studies that aren't, and that was a prospective, randomized, double-blinded, all the things that you want in a good done, and well done scientific study. There have been other smaller trials that have shown that the vitamin B6 and 12 can be helpful, maybe vitamin D and omega-3s. But the big thing is gonna be in a couple months, so ARES, age-related eye disease study, part two results will come out in the next three to four months. And they're probably, what they've done is they've taken out the zinc, they've, replaced beta carotene, which is a form of vitamin A, with zeaxanthin and lutein. I know I'm sounding like I'm starting to, I'm gonna like go into a rap, right? <laughs> zeaxanthin, lutein. <laughs> but, uh, but the reason that they did that is because when the first drug study was done, they couldn't get the form of vitamin A commercially processed um, that's, in the, that's in the macula. You know that, that yellow part of the macula you saw in the video? That is lutein and zeaxanthin. Well then they, they figure out how to manufacture that, put it into vitamins. And so, th so I think, I can't prove, you know, know for sure, but you know, probably lutein and zeaxanthin will be better than beta carotene. And there's also another arm of the study looking at omega-3, which is found you know, in, in fish like salmon. So there'll be some new vitamin recommendations. And, and so basically, when you take these vitamins, if you have the early forms of macular degeneration, you cut your risk of getting wet macular degeneration by 25%. So that's a pretty you know, substantial reduction. Question? Yes. Well, you, I think they want to wait on the mic, though. Uh, does it is aspirin a positive or negative on macular So great question. I was going to get that in a second, but let's hit that now. So about uh, two years ago, uh, the question was about aspirin. What about aspirin and macular degeneration? So there was a study that occurred in Europe a couple years ago that showed that patients on aspirin, now none of the, neither of these studies are great studies, but that study showed you have two times the risk of having wet macular degeneration if you were taking an aspirin even a few times a week, not even a daily aspirin. So we all kind of looked at that and like, hmm, that's interesting data because, you know, everyone knows aspirin is great for your body and, you yeah, whatever. Um, and so no one really made recommendations on that. Then another study just came out of Australia. It was published about a month ago, which confirmed, uh, again, not a great study, not a great study, but, but, but it did confirm <coughs> that there could be an increased risk for wet macular degeneration um, if you are on a, uh, aspirin a couple times a week or even daily. They basically, uh, it was a prospective study. They followed 2,500, it was like, I don't know, 2,437 patients over 10 years. Um, 250 of them were taking 
um, aspirin um, on a daily basis, and half of and the ones that were taking aspirin had twice the risk of getting wet macular degeneration as the ones who weren't. Now it, it's still not you know a perfectly designed study, so um, it's. We can't say for sure you can't take aspirin. I tell my patients, you know, if your doctor says, it's, if your medical doctor, because we are doctors, if your medical doctor says that um, you shouldn't be on aspirin, uh, or no, you can get off aspirin, then it's probably a good idea if you have uh, dry macular degeneration at a certain level. Now, what if you already have wet macular degeneration? Well, we don't really know if aspirin's bad. We do know that Coumadin is bad because with wet macular degeneration, if you're on Coumadin, you can get a massive hemorrhage underneath the retina. We just saw a patient yesterday from Armenia with that, and it will, it'll just kill your retina. But if you're on Coumadin, almost everybody who's on Coumadin has to be on Coumadin. You know, you don't, you don't want people to die and get off Coumadin, you know, so. Question, um, what, about, what, about, what about the effects of smoking with the, taking the, vitamins with beta carotene versus taking the vitamins without the beta carotene. Yeah. And also the dosage of aspirin. Like if a, if a person's taking a baby aspirin 50 right. milligrams a day versus 325. So two really great questions. So um, there was another study that showed taking beta carotene within 10 years of having smoked increased your risk for lung cancer. So there is a smoker's, there, it's a small increase. But there is a smoker's formulation of these vitamins that doesn't have beta carotene. In terms of the dosage of aspirin, you know, the people who were in these studies were taking various doses, including some who were just taking baby aspirin once a week. So we don't know what dose, we don't even know for sure if aspirin is a risk factor, but there's two studies that show it could be, and we don't really know th what the dosage levels are. Smoking, definitely. Smoking, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How does Occuvite fit in? Oxyvite? No, Ocu is it Occuvite? Yeah, so great question. Yeah, so Occuvite Preservision made by Bausch and Loam, you know, is, this, is the vitamin that was used in the study. Now, there are other companies that have replicated that exact uh, formulation, like ICAPS, which is made by Alcon. There's another one called Vitize, which you can order off the internet. But Occuvite Preservision is the one that was used in the, uh, in the uh, actual study. So yeah, Occupy's good. Um, now remember, I'm a rancher. I know I don't look like a rancher, and, but I just gotta, you know, gotta speak up for the ranchers of the world and the farmers, because I'm fairly certain that, you know, if you have a, everything that's good for your heart, you know, eating vegetables that have a lot of color in them, eating, serving of salmon once a week, you would get everything in those vitamins. But who's gonna, who's gonna do the study, you know? I mean, if someone would do the study for the farmers, that would be great. But, but they're not going to make money off of that. So you, you got to go with the vitamins. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, future directions, uh, stem cell therapy. So if, especially like with dry macular degeneration. If, you know that, that study, that picture I showed you with those scalloped edges where there was loss of cells? You know, if we can get um, cells in there that can replace that, either stem cells that can revert back to RPE cells, um, and I can talk about, stem cells are really interesting, or if we can get uh, cells, or we can replace the genes that are missing, um, we can have a good chance of, of, the gene therapy could work for wet and, and dry macular regeneration. What's really cool, just I want to mention about stem cell therapies, about seven years ago there was um, a group, I, I don't remember where they were from, but they basically showed that you can take any cell in your, human, in your body, even a skin cell, and you can just change seven genes seven genes, you know, your body, each cell has, you know, millions of genes, and you can make any cell, including a, a skin cell, a stem cell. So you don't have to go, you know, like do the whole embryo thing, and which is great, obviously. Um, so that's an exciting area. And then the other thing, you know, that I mean, um, I love my patients, you know, my patients love me. I see my patients more than they see their kids sometimes, because every four <laughs> to six weeks they're coming in, you know? <laughs> Uh, and as much as we love each other, you know, it's hard to come in, you know, it's not like we're meeting for ice cream, we're meeting for a shot in the eye. <laughs> so, you know, if, there's a lot of interest in long-acting, uh, you know, uh, uh, anti-vascular endothelial growth factor agents that could last three to six months or a year. Um, and, you know, the pharma, whatever pharmaceutical company comes up with that, they're going to have a gold mine. And patients will be happy, as much as we love our patients, we'll be happy because it is kind of a hard to, like every, you know, day do 10 or 20 injections. 
Uh, yes, sir. Um, you made a statement earlier today, well, it depends on who you see, your optometrist or general ophthalmologist. Yes, now, if I have an orthopedic problem on my knee, I can go to an orthopod and I can find out who specializes in knee. If I have a rotator cuff, I can find a different orthopod to get to it. But something, if I have a problem with my eye, I may know what the problem is, but how do I know what specialist in ophthalmology to go to? I, in, in, in fact, you've just, I've just really become aware of that, that you've got that many specialties. Right, yeah, and that's a great question. So, you know, it's, I'm going to answer that in a second, but you know, like, even if you are an orthopod, you know how many weeks of ophthalmology you had in medical school? Two weeks, right? So even, a, even an orthopod wouldn't even know what to do. Even another doctor wouldn't know what to do if he had an eye problem. Okay, and that's, I mean, that's how specialized we are, right? I specialize in this, you know, 250 micron layer of the eye. So, and it took me 13 years to get there. So the, the answer to that is there isn't a good answer, but as long as you're seeing either an optometrist or a general ophthalmologist on a regular basis, they're the ones who are going to direct you to what specialist. Like I kind of think of myself as a wide receiver and your optometrist, your general ophthalmologist, they're the quarterback. You know, and, and then when they throw the pass, I'm going to catch it. You know, we're going to have a touchdown together. But you can't figure it out. I mean, you can, if you have distortion or a blind spot in your eye, that might make you think, oh, wow, this could be macular degeneration. But generally, you would go then to your regular eye doctor, um, and then your regular eye doctor would say, hey, yeah, it looks like you could have something going on. Um, you know, see Dr. Denzo or Dr. Kanani or whatever. So that's generally the way it works now if any of you guys think hey wait a minute you're scaring me i want to get a rental exam you're welcome in fact we'll pass out cards you're welcome to call me directly just to reassure you but that's just generally the way it works i'm sorry to keep uh, all your questions have been great how active are you with um information on the and current with stems the stem cell research and clinical trials as well as the others and also do you have candy in your reception area <laughs> We did. It just goes away so fast. We got to replenish the candy on a regular All basis. Time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good point. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> so the stem cell, you know, there's, there's one company that's been approved for clinical trials. They're called Advanced Cell Therapies. And it's not approved for macular degeneration. It's approved for retinitis pigmentosa and star guards. They had some preliminary results that on three patients that were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine about two years ago. And now there's four or five centers. They're all um, at universities that are enrolling. Well, I think they're already enrolled. But th there's no stem cell um, trial for macular degeneration at this point. So if we can, and, and we want to know, um, my mom says to you, Dr. Dinza, What's going on with that stem cell research? Um, you're going to explain to her a little bit more instead of saying nothing. Yeah, actually, absolutely. Like if anybody comes in and they want information on the latest cutting edge things, you know, I'll definitely exp explain the trial, let them know if they're a candidate and if they're currently enrolling. You know, I mean, you remember, I came for like, when I was overseas, I was in an academic environment for 10 years, uh, you know, a full professor. And so I have a huge interest in the academic side of, of medicine. As I tell my staff, I mean, for us, I mean, this is, our practice exists for one reason, and it's a team, it's just not me. I mean, we're here to give you guys the best vision, to maintain your independence so you can read. That's why we exist. And if we can't uh, either direct you or offer you the cutting edge treatments, then we're failing in our job. So we take that really seriously. Yes, ma'am. Two years ago, I had cataract surgery. Um, <coughs> so two years ago, you had cataract surgery. Uh, this year, I found out that I had macular degeneration, both wet and dry. Why didn't they tell me at that time? Because when I went back to check, they found out that at that time, I had macular degeneration. Why wouldn't they have told me that? So I, I don't know the exact answer to that on an individual level. Now, if you have really um, dense cataracts, so when I'm looking at your eye or your eye doctor looking at your eye, they got to look through the cataract. So if your cataract isn't clear and it's cloudy, they might, in its early macular degeneration, it may not be easily detectable, right? Um, that could be one reason. Um, but it was in the charts when they went back. It said there that she has macular degeneration. Why wasn't I informed of that? Right? Now, sometimes what happens is that if it's really early, let's say you have one drusen. Let's say you come to my office, you have one small drusen. And I, I might not say, hey, hey, you've got macular degeneration. 
I might just say, hey, you got a little aging spot in your eye. We're just going to keep an eye on that. We're not going to worry about it. Now, if you come in with 100 drusen, I'm going to say, hey, you know, and they're big, you, you need to get on vitamins. So there's various levels. And it may be that for in your particular case, they thought your level was so minimal that they don't want to mention it to you because they were focused on the cataracts. But it's hard for me to know exactly what was in their minds when they were... Um, uh, talk. See, it does bring up another important point, which is that most every study has shown, because people ask me this, that cataract surgery is not an increased risk for macular degeneration. There could be a theoretical basis, you know, you're getting more light into your eye, light can uh, oxidize, right, you know, uh, uh, the cells. Um, that's why we also, there's no definite evidence, but we recommend if you have early macular degeneration, to use sunglasses um, to prevent a lot of that photonic energy oxidizing cells in the macula. But almost every study, 99% of studies, have shown that cataract surgery is not a risk factor for advancing or, or development of macular degeneration. Okay, so I got seven minutes. Yes, ma'am. We got a question over here. Uh, well, I almost hate to ask it because you're wondering, uh, you're on another topic, but. I'm just, so I'll ask simply, and I can ask my ophthalmologist who I go to and has found nothing wrong. But I do have something wrong. And uh, can you have something like um, an allergy, like uh, uh, when you use uh, skin protection, if it's strong, or, or uh, TV, not TV, um, computer? I had these black flashes that I couldn't read the newspaper, like the newspapers going way over here like this, you couldn't read for a while. I had spells of that, you know, for a couple of years, uh, now and then, and he could find nothing. So I'm wondering, wh where would you go next? I'm going to see him again, and he's found some double vision in the other eye, but I don't have macular division, I don't have dry eyes, I don't have anything. So but I got something. So you have this kind of, this thing that's kind of floating in front of your eye and blocking your vision? Well, it's like, it's like, almost like if you saw pinking shears a little longer, like it's going jagged like this, and then all the newspaper words would go over here, and I couldn't read. But then I'd clear up, I'd be going like this, and I'd push it and clear up. And a lot of times it feels like if you just took your eye like this and you cleaned it out, you'd get a lot of goop out of there, but there's nothing there. Yeah. So that's, a, so like, just from your description, that could represent maybe 50 to 100 different things. So it's, 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 it's. And he can't find it, but he's still looking at it. Well, good. I'm glad he hasn't given up on you. I was wondering, well, if he can't find it, can I come to you? I mean, uh, we'd be happy, you know. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. Now, because it's a little inappropriate, <laughs> but I'm asking now simply because I thought maybe it was something you were asking about, said, oh, wherever you were overseas. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, that, that symptom, right? What's really interesting, by the way, about eyes is that, um, it's really an amazing organ because I can look at your eye. Like a lot of times you'll come to my office and I'll just say, hey, you know, hold on a second. Let me just look and see what's going on. The rest of your body is covered by skin, right? So you got to, the history is so important. But a lot of times I'll just look in your eyes and say, okay, this is what's going on. This is what we're going to do. And that's how it was in the third world. So in the third world, you, I would see 100 patients a day. I wouldn't have to be documenting for Big Brother, putting things in computer, not being able to talk to you. I just say, hey, this is what you got. This is what we're going to do. Um, and then I would start saying, these are the risks. They would say, do you believe in God? Can you treat me like your father? I'd say, yes. They'd say, okay, let's go. <laughs> Shut up. Fix me up. You know? So I miss those days. Anyway, so, yes. Uh, Dr. Dinsa, you know, uh, I, you were my, one of the doc doctors at Nevada Retina Associates. I haven't seen you for the last two years. Yeah, we miss you. <laughs> so and I was recommended to go come and see you know retina specialist, and every year I went and there was nothing. Last time was six months ago when I went. This in my left eye, I had developed uh, this macular degeneration, okay. and uh, the crooked lines. And they said there's nothing they can do about it. So sometimes it can be that you have drusen, you know those spots that get right in the center, and sometimes that can cause that visual disturbance and, and we can't get rid of drusen. We've tried various things. That may be, I don't know for sure, but that could be what's going on. It's always, you know, yeah, you can, absolutely. I will just say that, you know, uh, like, you know, I've worked all over the world, been in universities, and uh, overall, I'm very, very impressed by the optometrists and ophthalmologists here. We have really state-of-the-art um, eye care here. You, I mean, uh, 
you don't have to go to San Francisco or New York City or Hopkins. You've got really, really good eye care providers, whether they're optometrists or ophthalmologists here. And what's kind of nice about Reno is that we all uh, work as a team together. So, um, and, and nobody would ever be offended, by the way, in that vein, if you want, wanted to seek a second opinion. So um, I'm really happy. It's really weird that I landed in Reno after living in all these huge cities, but I'm really happy after 10 years that with what we have here from an eye care point of view. I have a question on, um, <clears throat> I have dry macular and I've not on that ARIDS test that just finished. The, the ARIDS vitamin, yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm anxious to see. Yes, what. yes, we're all anxious, yeah. But my problem is I don't have problems seeing during the daytime, but at nighttime for night driving, I am really, you know, it really is a task for me. Unless if I, if I didn't have white lines on the road, sides of the road, I would never drive at night in the day. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Your contrast sensitivity, what you find with macular degeneration, you know, is definitely, that was kind of like the next slide. Lighting is so important having good lighting and a lot of patients even if they don't have wet macular degeneration or advanced dry their contrast sensitivity is decreased and they do have that is common you know it, it is harder um, I want to put it in one quick plug for e-readers I mean almost all of my patients have macular degeneration I recommend they get a Kindle or an iPad where you can really increase the font and you have good lighting because people love to read you know and uh, that can be very helpful what about those night glasses um, you know, people have various, you're talking about the yellow tinted ones? Well, I was just reading about that. that There's really no scientific evidence that any kind of tinted glasses helps for night vision. Yes. You talk about age-related macular degeneration. What about people who get it before 55? So there can, great question. So there are you know there are thousands of retinal diseases that and there are hundreds of retinal diseases that can affect the macula and there can be dystrophies so the dystrophy is like a genetic problem that can affect people's macula bef and it's not an age related issue so yeah there can be other things that affect the macula another by the way i didn't mention it but another really <laughs> this is an important point a lot of times uh, people will come in with what's called macular pucker or epiretinal membrane and people will be worried that that represents macular degeneration and that is not the case so macular pucker is when the top of your retina gets wrinkled you know how we all wrinkle on the outside we wrinkle on the inside it's age related of course <laughs> you know like what isn't but it's not macular degeneration so if you have macular pucker or an epiretinal membrane that's not macular degeneration I have two questions, and neither one's been answered yet. Which one is the worst, dry or wet? So generally speaking, dry is better. But remember I showed you that advanced form of dry where all the cells dropped out? And a small percentage of patients with dry macular degeneration, if it's really advanced and cells are atrophying, that can really affect your vision. But 90% of patients who have visual loss from macular degeneration, it's the wet form. Ironically, the wet form is the one that we have the best treatment for, which is these shots in the eye. And why would it go from dry to wet? No one knows the answer to that. And why would one eye be dry and the other eye wet? No one knows the answer to that. <laughs> We're waiting for you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. I think that, I think we should, we're probably at our one hour, yeah, that's exactly one hour. So thank you everybody for coming and um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.